Oh, see, I gave him all the tools he needs to man over the world. And I don't know what's up. He's just not doing what he's supposed to do. He's doing that thing. But he's okay. But I was the one who introduced him to the world. Everybody knows that Tony Mataron got his old break from Bounty Killer collaboration. Because he had talent, but I was the one who gave him the equipment and the tools to further his talent. And I don't know what, he's having problem with Kali and all the other ones. Yeah. Oh well, most of the great dub plates, it is really classics. Cause we have a problem now. The younger generation they can't do dub plates the real way. Cause dub plate has to do with the feelings and emotion, and it has to do with a crazy vibe. Cause a dub plate is not a song. The first line has to be effective. You can't sing a dub plate six eight bars before the effect comes. As I say, the first word, so not go dead, yeah, it's supposed to be very effective like a bullet. And this young generation, they don't do dub plates good. They sing the dub like they're doing the sound guy a favor, like, yeah, I'm just, I don't even want to hope in my mouth, man, I'm just. So when the dub play, it don't bring no energy to the crowd. So most of the dubs that would move me today would be some classic dubs, from a Buju Bantan, a Capleton, a Mad Cobra, or a Shabba Rankin, or a Super Cat. Those type of dub, some Half Pint, some real Johnny Hasburn. Those are the, the type of songs that would really get me off now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, because when you play a Michael Jackson, that's a bragging rights. That's not really a killing song. Michael Jackson ain't going to talk about killer boy. Michael Jackson's going to sing about love. So it's a bragging rights. I can play a Michael Jackson and dog, but the Michael Jackson and dog can't kill no sound. Think about it. Nah, it's going to make you look like, yeah, you're on another level because you've got this big hakuna you're playing, but... What he's saying is not effective to kill a sound. You couldn't play Michael Jackson and kill Kali. No. He's going to kill it with a Buju or a Bounty or a Capleton. More fire! People dead! <laughs> what was it about to kill about Kali? Let's go to Jamaica and get a start in Jamaica. Why are you saying, I'm going to give this kid a chance. I'm going to do some dumb play for him. What did you see in DJ Kali? Well, the vibe, the Khalid has a special vibe. Khalid has a special aura. He's captivating. He's infectious. Khalid takes you over spiritually. He had that spiritual vibe. And then now, uh, it's the first I met a Arab selector back in the days. When we just hear about Taliban and all these crazy Arab people, we never know that there was an Arab who played dance our music. I've never met an Arab before. So when I met Khalid as an Arab who played dance our music, it was impressive for me. And then now he, he used to play on the radio. He was a disc jockey also. So the fact that he's a disc jockey is more than just a selector in the club. And we need people on the radio. And then he's an Arab who loved dance our and he loved Jamaican culture. He's different from the normal, typical Arab guy. You, you know, Bounty Killer, I had the same phone for 20 years. I got him down as the Arab. <laughs> the Arab. 
Yes, so Khalid was a different person, man. And then now I find out that he's into some clash. I realize he came to Jamaica to clash. So I never know his clashing skill. I know that he's a good disc jockey and he plays. But when he came to Jamaica and he said he, he was going into the clash, I was like, yo, this is serious, but it's the right place for you to go and make your mark in Jamaica. So I gave him a few dubs and he went in the clash and he never won the clash, but he stands out. And that was all he needed to do. Just stand out more than all the others. And he did that about 98, 99. And from there, Jamaica people start to want him more Cali. Got to like the Arab guy. Yeah. True. How do you feel about this when you see people? Because everybody nowadays, you know, everybody from everywhere got the Jamaican vibe, the Jamaican <laughs> melody, the Jamaican. Yeah. Jamaican. That's true. They don't really go back to Jamaica and break Jamaica true. like they're supposed to. What do you say about this thing, Warlord? No, that's a serious problem we've been having over the years. That's why a lot of people like to call people culture vulture, as they are culture vultures. But we have people who show the love and the respect all the time. And it's not just people who get the benefit from Jamaica. People like you, Joey Cat. You never try to collaborate or get a big song, that's why you like Jamaica. You just love the culture from a you growing up in New York. And we embrace that. So Khalid was one of those persons. Khalid never used to think that oh Jamaica was gonna make him big and then Khalid got his break and he alright. I never even know Khalid was a producer. So as I told you now, I started to power with Khalid now 98, 99 and I'm making an album 2002. That's when he did the intro for the album, the Ghetto Dictionary album. So he said he wanted to produce a track. So I never know he was a producer at the time. But I know that he's into music and he's good at crazy ideas and innovative thoughts. So I said, all right, let me hear the beat. If the beat is on fleek, we're good. Because you my people, I don't care if you are a professional producer. You want to produce, we going to produce. So he gave me the beat and the beat was one whole throwback, bad man beat. So I did a song him. Test me if you can or maybe. Why you go there? Come and come, them no lazy. I am wild out, so go and tell one lady. So they come, 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 them are not shady. So that song was produced by Khalid on the album, and he did the intro. And from there, the relationship started to bloom, and then I started to come to Miami, and I'm, me and Khalid are part of street. And from there, so we become family. I don't even remember what the hell it is. First car I imported to Jamaica was an Acura T Hell. That was 1996. It wasn't that hard because tell you what, only when the cars are like over 3,000 cc, it caused a certain amount of duty. When the car is like 3.0 or under 3 liter, the duty is okay. It's normal duty. So if you're gonna bring in a big car like a Bentley or a Rolls Royce or those type of cars, then you gotta buy three times. You gotta buy to the dealer and then pay the government in Jamaica twice. So that's a, that's the only car I, I, I import at that time. And then in the two thousands, I import a Range Rover and what else I import? I, I, I buy all my vehicles in Jamaica now because I have to buy them three times. So the thing is buy it in Jamaica. Yeah, you got to buy it over there, you got to pay the government three times in Jamaica. So it's easy to buy it in Jamaica. I understand. Uh, Vibes Cartel, God bless Vibes Cartel, you introduce him to the world. Yeah, salute uh, Cartel. Is there any hope of 
of him getting out soon. Well, he's still having an appeal. The appeal is still going on. He, he's getting an appeal from a higher court overseas. So they are still in the whole process of appealing. Yeah, but the okay, system, so the system in Jamaica, but I know the system in Jamaica doesn't want to let out Vibes Cartel. So despite discrepancy in his case, our questionable things, they deliberately wanted to lock up Cartel. The system in Jamaica went after Cartel. So despite what his, his case or the scenario was, they wanted him. So if he's going to get any freedom, it's going to must be from a higher court overseas, but not Jamaica system. They wanted Cartel. They use him as an example. We not, I, I can't say if he's innocent or he's not, but I can say yes, he's guilty from what they shown me in the case. And the affidavit, they, 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 they are a lot of discrepancy. And the fact they are not a dead body, and there are only one evidence, and then they are a lot of tampering with the evidence, it's questionable. So that's why people kept saying free vibes cartel. And so what did, what, what did he represent? He represented the youth? He represented yeah, he represents the, the street. He represents the street. He represents the youths. He represents the now generation. And so they were mad at that? Yeah, they were mad at that and they have it like, oh, he's a bad influence. Yeah, and he has too much power and control over the culture. They tried it with me too. They tried to put me away too, but thank God they never had enough that they could use against me. Yeah, what, what was that like, man, when you hear uh, the Gaga man, Budja Bansai, Yo. and he landed in Jamaica? That was like a, a super holiday. Yeah, that was a little holiday. <laughs> That December 8th was really, really a celebration. Oh, you couldn't fly to Jamaica. I wasn't there for the Fuji concert. That's my only regret. I wish I was there. I'm seeing pictures of Shaggy in the crowd. Yeah. And Khaled on that thing and Shine. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. It was like a super holiday. Yeah, that was a super holiday. That was our last great holiday. Until COVID came and spoiled it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you something about Tequila. Your top five, I asked everybody, your, five, your top five rappers of all time, rappers of oh, all time. My top five rappers. <laughs> well, as I told you, Snoop Dogg is the one who really made me like rap. NDA introduced me, but it was really Snoop Dogg. So my top five rapper would be like Snoop Dogg. I would say Slick Rick is the king. But the rappers that brought me to rap is Snoop Dogg, Tupac, and Biggie Small. So my top five rapper would be Slick Rick, N.W.A., Tupac, Biggie Small, and Snoop. That's my top five rapper. Wow, you know it's crazy. Snoop Dogg called me last night. Face yeah. You know, all I can say to Snoop is I love you, Snoop. I love you. I love you. Uncle Snoop, yo. <laughs> Uncle Snoop is the biggest artist in the world. Yeah, he's the biggest rapper for me. True. He's the, he's, the, he's the biggest living rapper today that five-year-old kids knows of. He transcends all the eras. Like four generation now. Yeah, so. There's nothing you can do when you see Snoop Dogg. He FaceTimed me yesterday. I said, Snoop, I love you, man. I just, I, what do you want me to do? I love you. You know, he tell Khaled, hold you in. And Snoop Dogg tell us yesterday. They both said, fuck you guys. You guys in vacations. Send the plane over here. <laughs> I want to come vacation too. <laughs> <laughs> Bounty killer. I love you, and I thank you for coming on the show. I love you too, bro. Shine back. Could you tell us about the new album? Oh, well, I'm working on this new album. Well, it's 18 years since I last released an album, though. You know? The last album I released was the same one that Khalid did the intro, 2002. Get to Dictionary. It has been nominated for a Grammy, great success and everything. But 
They cancelled my visa 10 years ago. So that killed the whole vibes of me touring and making appearance overseas. So I kind of didn't lost the vibes of music. So I was just here holding my vibes with my family and just chilling. So it's Damien Jr. Gang Marley. Ron Marley this the brother. He's the one who really said I should do an album and he would executive produce it. So it's who Junior Gang. Marley, who, who said that? Junior Gang. That's Junior Gang. Ron Marley, smaller brother. Yeah, so that's Damien Junior Gang Marley. Ron Marley, smaller brother. Marley, yes. Yeah, so he's the one who encouraged me doing the album and he would executive produce it. So that's why I'm working on the album now. So the album is scheduled. Man, that's a beautiful thing, bro. And Marley's on here. Yeah, I so. I can't wait to hear that album. It's going to be a double album. It's going to be a double album. One like a reggae album and then one like a dancehall, raga style. Two side, you we know? We need some dancehall. We need yeah. So that's what I'm working you know, on now. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, what was it? Rihanna's birthday? Something. Rihanna's birthday or something. I love Super Cat. Cali goes get Super Cat surprise. Yeah. Super Cat waiting downstairs. This is a fancy place. <laughs> Cali got to send the white Bentley. You know, everything white for Super Cat. Cali tells me in the table, he's scared. He says, yo, man. No, the cat is scary. The cat is scary. His cat is very scary, man. Santa Masagana. Yeah. Yeah, Big Youth, he's one of the founders, man. He's one of the yeah, first one DJs. The well, we, he's I'm one of the first DJs I've been listening to. From the days of you, Roy, Rankin Cheva, and Big Youth, they are the three first DJs in Jamaica that we was listening to as little boys. Yeah, so Big Youth is one of my influence in reggae. He's one who help us to get to love in the music. In this legendary interview right here, Bouty, because I know nobody gets to interview you, I must shout out Jabba and Bobby Condes. Yeah, those are my bro. Music alive. They are the one who help break everything in New York. They are the founder. In New York, they keep reggae music yeah. alive. Straight up, Bobby, Bobby and Jabba, they are founders in the breaking of the reggae hip hop. Whole fusion and keeping the whole Jamaican culture alive in New York. And remember, I must say, Shine Head. Yeah, exactly. Busting reggae in hip yeah. in New York. Yeah. Shine Head and KRS One, they had a lot to do with the fusion of the dancehall and the reggae stuff with the hip hop. Yeah. They are the pioneers in New York. Thank you, Bounty Killer. God bless you for coming on here. You're with always you. welcome, my brother. Respect, my brother. We love you, Bounty Killer. I love you too, People bro. Are... Dad! <laughs> Kaboom! Claudia, when you reach out, I'll be there and I'll catch up to all this in the middle. You're in the man. Marksman in the inside, man. 